the mainstream media is lying to you. The mainstream media is misinforming you. Mm -hmm. At one point, media at its best was saying, here are two sets of ideas, evaluate them, right? Here's two sides of an argument, evaluate it. That was media at its best. Then we saw media move to, here's one idea, it's the best, believe it. That was already very problematic. But now, in the last two years, we've moved from, here's an idea, that's the best, believe it, to here is a group of people, hate them. And that's really dangerous. Today, we're excited to have with us the amazing Professor David Haskell. Welcome, Dave. Thanks for having me. So Dr. David Haskell is a associate professor at Wilfrid Laurier University in D digital media and journalism slash religion and culture. He has teaching and research focus on religion in Canada, media in Canada, and religion and media in Canada. Before academia, Dr. Haskell was a journalist. He started out as a print features writer, later moved to TV, working as a reporter in London, Windsor, and Waterloo region. He has received awards from TV Ontario and Radio Television News Directors Association. Prior to joining Wilfrid Laurier, he was a professor of journalism. He's the author of through a Lens Darkly, How the News Media Perceive and Portray Evangelicals. And he is a battle-hardened veteran of the culture war, if you don't mind me saying. Welcome. No, it's true. Fantastic. Thanks. Well, Dave, first question. Is there bias in mainstream media? Um, yes or no? <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 So so when I wrote this back in 2009, there was media bias. And and now I think, why was I complaining in 2009? <laughs> the good old uh, days. Because the good old days. Uh, absolutely. We've never seen anything like this. We've we've reached um, Soviet Union level propaganda here in Canada. And it, it's something that. You know, I, ha I haven't done the the uh, quantitative study that needs to be done, but uh, I can tell you a lot about the qualitative data that we're seeing. And I can also tell you about the quantitative quantitative data that I I've collected in the past. And it just shows us why journalists do what they do. It shows uh, what we know about them from the past, and then we can extrapolate to the present from that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's the main source of bias in the media from from your research? So what I've seen and what others have seen is that um, journalists, especially at the national level, will abandon balance and fairness in their reporting when they feel very strongly about an issue themselves. So when they've got heartfelt convictions of their own, they want to see that those convictions are privileged. And, and in that way, those who are on the opposite side of the journalist convictions are given no voice in coverage. Or, or if they receive coverage, the stories are manipulated to depict the opponents in the worst possible light. So, so just keep in mind, I, I think we need to remember that the ground rules for journalism used to be that you would be objective. That was the goal to strive for. But now advocacy journalism is the rule of the day. That is to say, you choose what is what you deem to be the best for society and then you do your best to make sure that those ideals or that ideology gets uh, is ascendant. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that's particularly the case at the national level. So as you get presumably then yeah. more local, that's less of an issue, less of a concern? Yeah, yeah. At, at the local level, there doesn't seem to be the hiring bias mm. in place. People who are somewhat more conservative in nature they are able to get in at the lower levels. They just don't advance. And there's some really good research out there. Some was done by Lydia Miljan and uh, Barry Cooper out of um, University of Calgary. Miljan is now at Windsor. But they looked at the hiring practices of places like the CBC. And, and there's clear statistical evidence that they just don't hire and, and don't promote people who are of a conservative-leaning persuasion. 
Yeah, it's very interesting. You reminded me of an interview. Uh, I think it was Andrew Marr interviewing Noam Chomsky and uh, Andrew Marr, the journalist, right? And they're talking about uh, self-censoring in the media or, or, or media bias. And Marr says something like, how do you know that I'm self-censoring? And Chomsky says, well, I don't think you're self-censoring. I think you believe everything you're saying. It's just that if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting here. And it's this idea that yeah. that uh, the whole hiring process and the education process creates a filtering system. And then only a certain type of person with a certain view passes through that filtering system. And then they, they're actually genuinely operating. They think they're objective based on their worldview. Um, and they just they just promote that, continue to promote that worldview. So it's not an act of self censor yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, it's almost like a religious inclination. Mm -hmm. um, they have found the truth, and and they view people who would oppose that truth as heretics. And uh, well, they're not willing to physically burn them. Definitely, metaphorically, they'll burn them, uh, making sure that they that their ideas are demonized. Mm -hmm. So then, if somebody gets through the hiring process, let's say. And let's say there's a coverage, there's coverage that, that let's say doesn't fit the ideological framework. What, what mechanisms then get kicked into place at that point? So you get past the hiring in the sort of the, it, I don't know if you could speak to this, but in the day to day, what sort of editorial mechanisms might there be to prevent or to continue or to perpetuate this, this issue? Well, you've got time, you've got lots of gatekeepers as you move up, you've got editors who will say, uh, the particular perspective that you are putting forward, just it, it's not what we're, we're looking for. And the editors have the ability to, to spike a story. They can just say, that's gone. So I'll give you an example that I can't verify, for example. Um, so there's a columnist. She's a, she's a freelance columnist, but she's published regularly in the National Post. Her name is um, Rupa... Subramania. Yes. Rupa Subramania. So Rupa has been covering the truckers convoy, the freedom convoy in Ottawa. And uh, and just a little bit of background, because it's it's somewhat pertinent to this story. Rupa herself is, um, I believe, a woman who is probably the daughter of immigrants from India. I've seen some of that uh, mentioned in her Twitter, social media stuff. So she's a woman of color. She uh, is is writing from Ottawa. That's where she lives. And what she's been doing is is been giving this account of the protesters that's actually very favorable to the protesters. It shows that um, many of the people that are in Ottawa protesting the vaccine mandates are, are people of color themselves. They are peace loving. They are talking about unity. And, and really, it is a counter narrative in that the mainstream narrative has been calling these people white supremacist, racist, et cetera, et cetera. So Rupa has been giving this other side of the story. Uh, in fact, um, she, she's she been noted by other international media for her side of the story. They're saying, hey, this is, this is really interesting coverage coming out. So Rupa has caught the attention of international media for what she is saying, what she's relaying, because it's so at odds with what the mainstream media is saying. But here's where I wanted to go with this. The question was, are you able to get that perspective published? This is what I found interesting. Typically, she publishes in the National Post. Mm -hmm. But her, her largest piece, her largest piece so far that really gave an account, she'd interviewed a 100 of these people who are in Ottawa protesting the vaccine mandates. And very thorough, great work done. It wasn't published in the National Post. Now, I wonder, could she not get it published? She had to get it published on the Substack account of Barry Weiss. Now, Barry Weiss, you might know, she was, she was the New York Times journalist who quit the New York Times because she said, we no longer have freedom to, to, to cover both sides of an issue. This was at the New York Times. Barry Weiss, very popular columnist, she quits mm -hmm. because she's saying you can't cover both sides of an issue. And then we find that Rupa, rather than have her piece published in the National Post, 
it, it finds its way onto the Substack account, which is an independent, it's sort of like a blog style account of Barry Weiss. Now, I can't say conclusively that uh, Rupa couldn't get it published in the National Post. I haven't spoken with her. I don't know her personally, but it just seems very odd to me that this excellent article couldn't find its way into the mainstream media and had to be put on this, what we'll call a dissident format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Dave, just to follow up on on that disconnect between what's being reported about the the Ottawa, the trucker convoy, uh, and what's actually happening. So I ended up taking the advice of uh, Dr. Julie Panessi and going to Ottawa because I was hearing all these things from Justin Trudeau that there was all these Nazi flags everywhere and racists and all sorts of really bad people. Yet I'm also watching live streams on the internet. And now I'm seeing something completely different. And I figured, you know what? I got to go see this myself. I want to be able to have first person experience to be able to check and verify the, the information coming from these sources. And you know, when I got there, it was, it was something uh, that it's completely contradictory to the Trudeau uh, media narrative because I saw all sorts of people there of different colors, ages, socioeconomic status. You've got truckers, you've got the Starbucks crowd, you've got children, children in, in uh, strollers, uh, pets. You've got, you know what I even saw? People in wheelchairs were there. People with walkers. Real diversity. Com Real diversity. Complete diversity. You had, you know, the bouncy castles, kids playing there, there people dancing in the street, Canada flags all over the place, the francophones, the English speaking, the indigenous playing drums. Like every everybody was there. Everybody was celebrating freedom and, and asking for their freedoms back. No Nazi flags. And so I personally now have experienced that stark contrast and disconnect between the mainstream narrative and and reality uh and that that is just absolutely shocking i don't know if i could trust mainstream media <laughs> from this point on and that's a problem right. <laughs> and and so we we look at that and i mean there were some really odd things uh and and you you look at people who are conspiracy theorists and increasingly, the things that they said were conspiracy theories a year ago have suddenly come to fruition. Mm -hmm. You know, they're saying things like, well, they're going to freeze your bank accounts. And then suddenly people have their bank accounts frozen. Those people who contributed to the, the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa. Uh, it, but, but I wanted to talk about this in particular, back to the, the protesters in Ottawa. Strangely, there are uh, closed circuit TVs that monitor downtown Ottawa. And apparently they're, they're publicly accessible. Well, since the protests have began, uh, begun, those were shut off. Wow. Uh, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms actually put forth some kind of court motion to say, hey, why are those turned off right. and turn them on? Because it would allow people to actually see what was happening. But what we have to remember is the, the government... The people in power right now don't want you to know what's actually happening because they want their narrative to, to triumph. If they are going to harm these people who are in downtown Ottawa, they have to convince the public that these people are worthy of harm. So they can't let you see what's actually happening. You, they can't let you see the diversity, the unity. You know, there are little bits of truth that sneak out. For example... The Ottawa Police Service still had to acknowledge that crime has gone down since the protesters arrived because they, they do keep those statistics. So, so these little bits of truth come out and they're in contrast to this, what we'll call the mainstream media narrative. But all the same, the mainstream, mainstream media narrative is still prevalent and is still influencing the majority of people because most people don't go on social media. Uh, most people still don't doubt the mainstream media. They they haven't had that awakening or that red pill moment. You know, it's it's. Uh, I think for some of our listeners, I, I don't know, maybe at least for a small small number of them, they might be shocked by the idea that the government and the media are not telling people the whole truth, and that they have biases and that they have um, vested interests, right? Um, so that that's a big shocker. That's a big shocker. 
And and I, I uh, you know, in preparation for this, I, I read a little bit of uh, Noam Chomsky again. So I recommend this book, Media Control, uh, where, where he talks about media bias and the various influences on media that lead to that bias. But he sets, he, he writes about something that I remember that's very relevant to, I think, what's happening here in Ottawa. He talks about the Mohawk Valley formula, which was used to deal with strikes. And um, the idea was rather than breaking up strikes with violence, you use carefully crafted propaganda. And uh, he says the following, he says, you don't want to go and use a technique of goon squatting and breaking knees. And I'm quoting, uh, that wasn't working very well anymore. But through the more subtle and effective means of propaganda, that's what you want to use. And he says, quote, the idea was to figure out ways to turn the public against the strikers to present the strikers as disruptive, harmful to the public and against the common interests, end quote. So there you have essentially a, 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 a plan that involves media and that involves public figures to turn the population against, in that, in that case, the strikers and are we seeing the same thing here where they want to shut down this convoy, this, this protest? And so what they're doing is trying to turn the public against the protesters, calling them all sorts of nasty names and saying that they're bad people. Oh, sure. And, and so you, you continue to see Trudeau repeat his lie, his lie that these people are racist. These people are misogynist. These people are white supremacists. Again, in the coverage that Rupa did, she showed all the people of color who are involved in this. And But let's get back to this notion of creating an impression that, that the protesters are, are worthy of harm, mm. are deserving of harm. So I'll give you an example. And again, we need to look at these examples because they're indicative of other things that have happened. We know for a fact that... Uh, there's a particular group in Canada called the Anti-Hate Network. And the head of the Anti-Hate Network is Bernie Farber. Now, Bernie Farber, oh, by the way, the Anti-Hate Network is a far left leading group that will uh, that demonizes really anyone that even has a, a hint, a whiff of conservatism to them. They are able to find right wing conspiracies everywhere. They're able to find terrorists everywhere in right wing communities. So just to give you the background there, but they're also funded by the federal government to the hundreds, uh, to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this anti-hate network really could be conceived as uh, an arm of the liberal government today. And here's what happened. Bernie Farber puts out on his social media an account, and it said that this poster, this white supremacist anti-Semitic poster was found in downtown Ottawa. And it was proof that the people who are involved in this protest down in Ottawa or up in Ottawa, uh, they are white supremacist Nazis. Well, an investigative journalist, uh, Jonathan Kay, he, he took a look at that, that poster, the picture of the poster that Farber put on his social media, and he determined that it was actually a poster that had come from Florida two weeks earlier. And in fact, not only that, the, the actual picture that Farber put up on his social media was the exact picture of the poster as it appeared in Florida. It was the Florida poster. It wasn't taken in Ottawa. It wasn't from Ottawa. Mm. Now, the reason I point that out is here's direct evidence of a manufactured mm -hmm. hate crime. Mm -hmm. And so, so when those people say, you know, I really I'm questioning that there was someone in the crowd on the first day of this protest who was holding a Nazi flag and then they never appeared anymore. There was someone in the crowd who was completely masked, who was holding a Confederate flag. And in fact, that person was told to leave by the other protesters and then they never returned. But those people appeared that one time and it just so happened that there were really, uh, there were people able to capture it on media and pass it along to the mainstream media. Now, I'm not saying that it was manufactured, but what I am saying is we have evidence that other, other uh, false flags, that's what they call them, false flags were prevalent. We know that. So it calls into question these, 
what, what apparently are anomalous events at at the protest that just don't, don't seem to coincide with everything else mm-hmm. that we're seeing. So people are right to be skeptical. And back to your point, not, Chomsky says that we should expect the government to create the impression. And sometimes to create the impression, they'll actually insert people to, to do that for them. Mm-hmm. And I think one thing you see with the coverage something that's particularly jumped out to, out at me is you'll see the meet the meet the I'll call it the corporate media coverage and then you'll see the House of Commons discussions particularly from liberals and NDP and they're they're pretty much echoing the same points so the emphasis on on the racial hate emphasis on the swastika flags emphasis on all that kind of stuff and there's a complete uh there's a complete uh let's say uh ignoring of any other type of coverage that you're seeing let's say on we'll call it maybe more independent media or like guerrilla media where people just get their cameras out and they're videotaping and they're putting it up on youtube like there's a complete disconnect Mm -hmm. between corporate media house of commons let's say debates and then what anybody can go and see on youtube or go to ottawa and see so so there's like almost like a feedback loop between the politicians and the media. So it's hard to say like, okay, are the politicians getting their points from the media, the media getting their points from the politicians. And there, 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 there definitely seems to be some insul- insulated circuitry there where no other information can get in other than let's say those isolated incidents that may or may not have been manufactured or planted. Sure. And, and listen, I, I just want to reiterate, I'm not saying that I have any proof that those flags, those detestable flags, that did appear at the protest. I'm not saying that I have proof that this was uh, instrumented uh, or that it was created, manufactured, you know? Provocateur. Uh, right, exactly. Uh, so, but I'm saying that those people who were thinking that now have reason, have some rational reason to think that. But let's get back to this idea about whether the government is influencing what the media coverage uh, covers and what they don't. Well, of course they are. Here, here is an undeniable fact. In Canada, mainstream media are currently re- receiving $600 million a year from the federal government. And only those media who are deemed legitimate and respectable are able to get that funding. Well, what does it mean to be legitimate and respectable? Mm-hmm. It means that you're going to toe the line as to what the government says is respectable, is legitimate. Mm -hmm. Now, on top of that, at the beginning of the pandemic, in addition to the 600 million, another 60 million dollars was given to undisclosed media outlets. So we weren't told who got this, but we were told why they got it. They were got they got it if they were if they would agree, sorry, if they would agree to promote the government's message. And the only reason we know about this is that some investigative journalists who work in Ottawa and they're independent of the mainstream media, they work for Black Locks Reporting, which is credible and and uh, really the best investigative news team we have. They were able to uncover those documents saying, wait a minute, there was another 61 million given to, to mainstream outlets if they would agree to promote the government's message to the people. Mm-hmm. So the, it, that really, what does that tell us? That really reminds me, because Chomsky was brought up earlier, that really reminds me of some of that old Chomsky stuff where he talks about the filters, the five filters, I believe it is. And one of the filters basically being like getting access. So if you don't, if you don't sort of go along, you don't get access to the stories, you don't get access to the people. And this seems to add right. an even darker layer to that saying not only will you not get access to the people to get the stories or to get the quotes or to get the get the information you won't even you won't get money so there's there's money strings attached as well as access strings which is i don't even think something chomsky would have even foreseen when he was talking about that well and he wouldn't have foreseen the media environment right now that that is uh starved of cash right Mainstream media right now is in free fall. And so when somebody says, we're going to allow you to keep your jobs, if you just do what we say, it's really, it's really difficult to think that they wouldn't 
do that. Uh, what, what's that expression? Um, someone, someone is not willing to see the truth when their income depends on them not seeing it. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I'm probably just butchering that saying, but the, the intent is there. Like we, we get what's going on and combine that. So it's not just the financial imperative, although that's incredibly important. The news media and a study after study, my own work, I, I found this. Uh, in fact, there's been no study in Canada in the last 20 or 30 years that has gone against this finding. The media really lead our country in terms of um, left wing, progressive, liberal values. And one of the key ideas that are found in those liberal values is this notion that the government really should guide the population in what is right. So you you might think, and it is a contrast, at one time the media were really all about free expression. They were really about freedom of conscience. But increasingly, especially in the last 10 years, the media have jumped on this bandwagon that, well, the common people really might go in the wrong direction. So therefore, as the elite thought leaders, we need to show them the way to go. And so they've they've jumped on the bandwagon of advocacy journalism. They believe they have the answer. And they're happy when the state, when the government forces people to move in a direction that they already agree with. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like a man. It's like a management. You get the, you manage society through these mechanisms because you know what's you know what's best. Yeah, sure. And, and- so, so you've got this combination of financial uh, motivation and ideological motivation. It's really interesting, this idea um, that essentially on that view, media and government and, and the other aspects of the knowledge granting bodies or knowledge verifying bodies, including academia, that they seem to have a monopoly on truth or they're granted a monopoly on truth. And uh, I'm, I'm reminded here um, of this uh, book by a, a psychology guy, Joseph Yuzinski, and uh, he studies and writes on conspiracy theories. So here's the book, uh, Conspiracy, Conspiracy Theory, a Primer. And he talks about this, uh, this notion of the epistemic establishment. And here's what he says, uh, specifically with regard to conspiracy theories, right? Conspiratorial theorizing. He says, the bottom line is that citizens should should believe accounts from properly constituted epistemic authorities rather than theories that either directly conflict with the epistemic authorities or assert knowledge that has yet to be deemed authoritative by the epistemic authorities. A conspiracy theory may be true, but people are not justified in believing it until the appropriate epistemological authorities deem it true. Okay, so... What they're saying is you can't believe something is being true until one of these institutions that that are all kind of related right now, academia, media, and government, say that it's true. So you could actually go to, right. like the thinking here is you could go to Ottawa, you could see all these lovely people there, but you can't believe that this is really a festival because Canadians don't really know how to protest. We just know how to do festival. You can't believe that to be true. Until somebody in the media says it's true. That's how absurd this is. <laughs> you have to sit back and right. wait. You have to just wait till somebody declares it. <laughs> well, it, it, and you've really hit on something which is fascinating to me, Dan. And, and I've noticed it before, but it's never been done with such uh, virulence. It's this idea of experts say. Yes. And this is a game that we've been seeing since the beginning of the pandemic. This experts say. And really, it's just a trick of media. Here's here's what you do. You find the expert who agrees with your opinion, and you only let those experts speak. So I'll give you a great example. A great example of this uh, is there there was a, a group of academics and a group of academics who were against lockdowns in particular. What they saw was that the lockdowns that were done in order to solve the problem of the pandemic or lessen the spread of COVID, they looked at it and they said, you know what? Years of research, years of peer reviewed studies show us that these these lockdowns that are being proposed are going to do more harm than good. 
And so these academics, they formed a, a group together and they wrote out a declaration. It was called the Great Barrington Declaration. Now, the Great Barrington Declaration, as I said, focused primarily on this notion that these lockdowns are doing more harm than good. And I'll let you know that the, the people who were who who founded this Great Barrington Declaration, they were the heavy hitters of public health and epidemiology. We had we had um, I can't remember his name, but I'll tell you, he was uh, a leading professor of biostatistics and epidemiology at Harvard. We had um, I remember Gupta. He was a leading epidemiologist, public health expert from Oxford. And then we had one more fella, and I can't remember his name. But, but, Bacharya, I believe. Yes, from St yeah. Stanford, yeah. from Stanford. So here we have Harvard, Oxford, and Stanford. These were leading experts in their field. And they're saying, listen, we've looked at the data. We know the data better than probably anyone else. And we're going to put together this Great Barrington Declaration and allow our colleagues to sign it as well. Well, when you look, when you look at the coverage in Canada of this, and I'm being completely accurate, when you look at CTV's one article, that so one news publication that they, they put out on this, what they do in the, uh, in the headline is they say, experts debunk mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. this, or are experts criticize. Mm -hmm. Now, which experts? So they had a few experts from Canadian universities saying, that the assessment from this Harvard, Oxford, and Stanford professor was just simply not valid. Not only that, in the CTV and the CBC coverage of the Great Barrington Declaration, they didn't even say who the authors were. In addition to that, they didn't interview the authors. So again, we're going back to this idea when the media say, our experts, are debunking this particular notion, claim, study, you have to remember they will choose the expert that coincides or, or gives privilege to their particular opinion. Because if this were covered fairly, the Great Barrington Declaration would have been a bombshell. Here are these world experts from Harvard, Oxford, Stanford. In, in fact, there were Nobel Prize winners who also signed it in the original version. Uh, and then there would come to be, I believe it was um, 16,000 have now signed it. Researchers in public health have now signed it. Nearly 50,000 uh, medical practitioners have signed it. This is not fringe. These are the world, the, the world experts. But now the media simply has to find one or two who disagree, put them into their stories, not even mention the other people who actually were the, the real experts, and boom, there you have it. So it's to your point how they can, they can simply say these people are experts. They make them the experts and then say these people aren't the real experts. One thing that's mm -hmm. particularly interesting in your example is when you talk about how the way the story was presented with certain omissions, so you don't, you fail to include the credentials of the experts that disagree. So we've talked a lot about, even the the, yeah, right. You don't even, so people can't even look it up or maybe have a hard time looking it up or yeah. You, so we've talked about how there's maybe these firewalls, you don't get access, you don't get hired. Uh, certain stories don't get covered. Things get omitted. One of the things I'm, one of the things I've been interested in is are these more subtle forms of, let's say, manipulation in the actual stories themselves? So like omitting certain details or the way things get phrased. One thing that's particularly jumped out at me a lot lately, and I'm wondering if there's like sort of known tactics in journalism school, let's say, or if people just kind of pick it up from experience. But one of the things I've noticed is this use of the phrase so-called. Yeah. So I, that's a particularly yeah. clever one I find. So I can get on here and say, this is David Hask, Dr. David Haskell, so-called uh, expert right. in media. And I, I'm not yeah. lying, am I? I'm not, No. <laughs> but I'm, well, I'm immediately well, questioning your credentials just by saying so-called. Yeah, yeah. Now, now what you've hit on, Jeff, is there's this larger area of um, 
media theory. And it's looked at this very extensively. And it's called frame theory. Mm. And it's really simple. It's just the words you use have connotations. Mm -hmm. And if you use so-called, you are really intimating to your audience, don't believe this person, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, you can use wording, specific words. You can omit. Uh, or, or you can, here, let me give you a great example. So this is to your point. Um, there, and again, I want people to know media bias is happening. And here is an example where the media misrepresented a study by, by focusing on one area and not on another, by deliberately choosing to not focus on the main idea. Here, let me give it to you. Okay, so the University of Waterloo conducted a study. The engineering department at the University of Waterloo conducted a study to see uh, how effective typical masks were at stopping the spread of COVID. So by typical masks, they looked at cloth masks and the masks that most people wear, the surgical masks. So surgical and cloth masks. Not They actually did look at N95, and I can tell you a little bit about that too. But 99% of people were, are wearing cloth or surgical masks. And they wanted to see, okay, how effective is that? So they, they did these studies looking at airflow out of masks. They looked at the, the masks themselves in terms of being a barrier for uh, viral particles. And here's what they determined. And this is, again, local, University of Waterloo, great study. They found that there was a 90% failure rate when it came to surgical masks and nearly a 100% failure rate when it came to cloth masks. So you would think that the headline, that the headline would then be the mask you are wearing doesn't work. The mask that you are wearing does not stop the spread of COVID. But let me, and I'm going to give you, uh, this one is from CTV. And I'm actually, I'm going to call it up on my screen here just a second. Okay, this is the headline that appeared nationally from, the CT, uh, from CTV uh, news outlet. They said this about the study. Here's what they say was the main finding. High efficiency masks up to six times better at filtering aerosols than cloth or surgical masks, says Canadian study. Is that re that was that, that relative versus absolute? Uh, is that that game that's getting played there? Absolutely. So, so any normal person, any rational person, what do they call it uh, um, in, in the courts? Uh, any right thinking person, mm -hmm. the average person would have said, wow, this study showed that there was a 90 percent failure rate and that these masks do not need to be worn because they don't do what they say. Mm -hmm. But the media, the mainstream media comes out with this idea that, well, high efficiency masks are up to six times better. Well, nobody's wearing high efficiency masks. Why are you even telling us this? So this is an example of media framing that really does show us, the media says, look over here, not over here. It's, it's sleight of hand at its very worst. So now would that be consistent with, uh, let's say, misinformation? Would that be classically misinformation or it doesn't, doesn't quite fit? Because technically, let's say it's not wrong or do we even need well, to classify this? So th I would say when you talk about misinformation, mm -hmm. as far as I understand it, misinformation was it's when you spread something, but there's no ill intent. You're not trying to deceive, you just misunderstood. That's misinformation. Right. But disinformation is with intent. And so we have mainstream media spreading disinformation. Okay, so you'd say that's disinformation. And, in that example, well, let's say, would that be? Yeah, in that example and many and many others. So the, the example I gave you of CTV and CBC's coverage of the Great Barrington Declaration. It is common practice in media, or it should be, that you actually say, who wrote this thing? Where were they from? 
Not only that, you're supposed to give voice to that person so they can represent their thoughts in their own words. All that was absent. Mm -hmm. That is that the, the intent there is disinformation. If it's the case that that the mainstream media has this disinformation and has so much bias, do you actually see now value in uh, this trend where media is shifting into these other areas like the substacks, you know, uh, podcasts, for instance? Um, so is it do you are you observing this this change where truthful media is now moving to these different outlets um, and people are still kind of stuck on the mainstream media but maybe it's time to shift and explore some of these other alternatives. What do you think about that? Uh, I think it's necessary. So if I, if I had um, one takeaway from our discussion together, for, for people who are unfamiliar with this particular phenomenon, the mainstream media is lying to you. The mainstream media is misinforming you. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's incumbent upon anyone who wants to know what reality is to go and seek it out on their own because you're not getting it anymore from mainstream media. So you have to be a more active participant. You can't just sit that back and passively receive the dominant, let's say, corporate media. You'd have to go seek it out through these alternative sources. Yeah, well, the, the model of objectivity, the model of fairness and balance has been abandoned. Mm. I'll give you another example. So we talked about how this all begins even in the universities and then percolates out. So right now, uh, there is a, a body that influences the, the journalism education of anyone studying at college or university in Canada. It's called J Schools Canada. Mm. And J Schools Canada well, it really doesn't have any legislative teeth and it can't tell you what to teach. It does have influence. And any uh, every journalism program has a representative on J Schools Canada. And the, the mission statement of J Schools Canada says this. It says their number one mission is to, pro to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in both the classroom and in media coverage more generally. Now, again, I'm paraphrasing here, but, but I'm, I'm very, very close. Well, I noticed that. And so I wrote to the, uh, the person who heads J Schools Canada, and I said, I can't help but notice you have nothing in your mission statement about being balanced, being objective, telling both sides of the story. That is completely absent. How can you justify that? You're actually telling students, you're influencing students to abandon what used to be the gold standard. The only response I got was, thank you for your inquiry. So, so what I'm telling you is that right at the level of journalism training in Canada, the notion that objectivity, balance, and fairness should be preeminent has been abandoned. And it's not even... And it's been substituted. It, would you say it's, it's not even present at all? Like it just it hasn't been abandoned as the predominant value. It has been abandoned altogether, in your opinion. Like it's not even a factor. Well, anymore? I don't know what happened. I mean, there's still academic freedom. I teach some courses in media, and I know it's not abandoned in my courses. Mm. But but the overall uh, sense, I mean, at the level of the institution, at the level of those influencing the people down below. They're saying this is the right way to behave. It's been abandoned. And let's remember that, that we are seeing across the board in academia the notion that particular ideas of objectivity, merit, competency, basic, basic, I guess, enlightenment ideals are now being demonized as white supremacy, racist. The very, the very notion uh, oh, sorry, the notions upon which universities were founded, the pursuit of objective truth, it's now called into question mm -hmm. as colonialism, white supremacy, racism. So, so those people who are arguing for those kind of things, they're equally demonized. Mm -hmm. Just, just two, two quick thoughts here, uh, Dave. So one is that 
With the advent of Substack and podcasts and so on, what's very interesting is that you can actually access experts directly right now because you can you can follow experts. You can follow a lot of them have Substacks now. They have their own outlets, right? So you can actually bypass the media altogether, the mainstream media, and go directly to the experts, which is kind of a new innovation. And I, I'm quite excited about that. Um, so... Uh, the other the other point I wanted to make very quickly with regard to academia and what's happening there, it seems like uh, you know bring this back to the to the pandemic and and particularly the vaccine mandates that the vaccine mandates may be serving as an ideological purge to some extent because if you're someone who uh, values human rights and uh, bioethics as they historically have been, and you reject the vaccine mandate, and therefore you yourself don't want to submit to those, well, now you're going to find yourself on the outside, right? And so I, I think we're living in, a, do you agree with this, that we might be living through uh, a moment where there is this filter being applied, where people of a particular viewpoint are being systematically now systematically excluded and they're being excluded from hospitals they're being excluded from government they're being excluded from media they're being excluded from academia what are your thoughts on that yeah yeah no it, it is a purge and we can look at what happened at our own universities so those students who said i'd actually like the right to my bodily autonomy i'd like the right to my medical privacy these were, these were rights that up until a couple of years ago, no one questioned. Uh, they, they also did their own research. They said, well, I've seen the reports. I've seen the reports. They're not, they're not being publicized in the mainstream media, but I see that there is a higher risk of myocarditis for young men, university aged. And there's really good evidence of this. So then because of that, they say, I don't want to submit to the vaccine. I don't want to be part of the vaccine mandate. Those students who thought for themselves, those students who took the time to do their own research, the things that we used to used to say were what we wanted in a student. If you did that as a student, you were expelled. You were deregistered from your program. Even now, even now, students who stood up for their rights have been banned from campus. So, and it, it makes me, again, going back to this idea of media bias, because I want to tie all this to the media bias. If, if, the, the, if the media were actually performing its duty, we would be seeing profile reports. So profile reports, are we see them in the media all the time where someone has been done an injustice and then their story is told. So we have students, we have students, we have faculty, we have staff, uh, people across Canada who have lost their jobs. Try and find a profile piece in any new major newspaper that talks about these people. You see, it would create sympathy. If you found out that there was a single mom, and I know, I, I, I've had students, single moms, finishing a degree, hoping to get employment, now can't feed their kids because they insisted on their rights and freedoms that were up to two years ago protected. And their university said, screw you. You don't get your rights and freedoms. Mm -hmm. And then, and now they can't feed their kids. That's a story the media should be covering and they haven't at all. So we're talking about this notion. Is the media complicit with government? Absolutely. The media at one time was supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's a standard motto. Now they are comforting those people who are in power. Where are the stories about all these people who can't feed their family simply because they wanted to have their rights respected? They're not there. What's interesting about that too is that seems to me like those would be very popular stories. The people would want to read those. So from this idea that, okay, you know, people just do things out of, let's say, for financial reasons. It seems like, let's say, for viewership, readership, clicks, whatever you want to call it, that those would actually be quite beneficial. So this idea that, okay, but, but, people are just, these 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 uh, media entities or corporations, they're greedy, they're businesses, they just want to make money, let's say. 
it would seem to me that that example there would run counter to that that thought namely that that seems like it would be quite a lucrative direction to go but yet they perhaps choose to go in a different direction for ideological reasons and we talked a little bit about how there's financial incentives for following those ideological re- reasons as well that's right but there does that's seem right. to be like a yeah. lack of self-interest at, at play here and and we're now we're now hitting this larger idea so so if you want to ensure that the general population, what we'll call the uninformed population, hates a particular group, you can't let them feel sorry for that group. And so by eliminating all those profiles for the tens of thousands who have been negatively affected by this, where are the, where are the stories about the vaccine injuries? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So do a thought experiment for just a yeah. second. Up until the COVID uh, pandemic, Think about anyone you knew or had ever heard of who had a vaccine injury. For most people, the number is zero. The number is zero. But now think of the last year since the vaccines were rolled out. Do you know someone who's had a vaccine injury? The majority of people can say yes. Where are the the thousands of newspaper articles talking about this? I mean, in, every, in my own life, I know two students who were brought to hospital for myocarditis, and I have a close relative who now is experiencing uh, the inability to, to close their hands after having the vaccine. Wow. Now, I know that's anecdotal. Mm-hmm. I know that's anecdotal. But when you have so many people, when you have people within your circle and this is this just isn't common. Again, reflect on what was with these other vaccines. You'd never heard of a vaccine injury, and now it's commonplace. But we don't have, we do not have the articles that are, are talking about this. And so that's purposely, uh, we, we know that there's suppression of that information. Mm-hmm. Something that I've seen as well is, I'll say correlation, not causation, between, let's say, just anecdotally, between let's say the medical intervention, I'll call it, and some weird physical ailment, like a rash or puffiness or something happens that's completely out of the ordinary. And uh, there's, a, there's a lack of connection between, between the two things. And there's a searching that happens for other things. Like, well, I had a haircut that day as well, so maybe it was something... <laughs> Maybe it was some rash caused by the hair and it's, it's completely dis. or I went to, you know, I went to this other thing or tried some new face cream or whatever and completely ignoring that it could have been this other thing. So there's like a lack of sense making possibly directly connected to it as well. So yeah. it, it self reinforces, um, that there may be fewer of these stories or fewer connections because there's, they're not talked about. It's not on top of people's minds. They don't make the connections because maybe, the with the institutions they're not they're not given permission to make that connection yet (laughs) and you have to wait to be told to say okay that's that's the connection you can go ahead and do that now so so i'm trying to build the case that the media is is biased beyond anything we've seen in the past Uh, especially um well and i'm talking about the canadian media in the united states they're actually uh, our, our media who are breaking the mold, they are trying to speak out for the people. But let me give you just another example here. Uh, and again, so I'm of the position that people who were vaccine hesitant, that didn't want to take part in the vaccine mandate program, that they that their position was rational, right? I'm saying that they that was a rational choice. Now, That doesn't mean that people who got the vaccine were irrational. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that I could see why people might choose not to be vaccinated. The media wants it to be the case that that the typical person would not be able to see any reason. And I'm going to give you another example. There, There have been numerous cases where very important studies have come out in in top medical journals, top scientific journals, that were simply not reported here in Canada. I'll give you you just 
there are, there are at least 29 that I counted, but let me give you three. And, and if you want to talk about more, I will, but I'll give you these, these three. So uh, first one that I'll mention, this was a, a, a peer reviewed study done by Harvard researchers. And it appeared in September, just as they were rolling out the vaccine mandates, it appeared in the European Journal of Epidemiology, a, a high ranked prestigious journal. And what it found was in a study of 68 countries, there was no correlation between the percentage of the population uh, that were vaccinated and lessening of the spread of COVID. So again, to, to just rephrase that, in 68 countries, they looked and they said, as you get more people vaccinated, do we see a decrease in the spread of COVID? And the findings were no. And that's also true across counties in, in the U.S., right? They also, I think, looked across a series of counties in the same trend. Yeah, virtually no exactly. trend. If anything, and, the opposite and, trend. <laughs> in fact, well, you're right, Dan, because they found that there was the one spot where they found a, a statistically significant difference is when there was greater spread in some places where there was greater uh, population vaccinated. So you would think that that peer reviewed study done by Harvard researchers with just excellent data would have made the news in Canada. Not a single mainstream news outlet in Canada ran an article on that. And you say, well, Haskell, how do you know? Well, I have access to databases through my university where I can search particular uh, subjects like the name of the journal article, the, the researchers who did the study, and then I see whether or not any media, CBC, CTV, Global, Globe and Mail, National Post, uh, you name it, whether they covered it. And they didn't. That's a dereliction of duty. No, that's purposeful suppression mm. of important information. Give you another example, because it goes far beyond this. Uh, the Lancet, the British medical journal, The Lancet came out with a study that showed that using a sample of thousands from the UK, so excellent data pool, they showed that uh, the, the virus, the COVID virus spread equally, was caught and spread equally between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Uh, it, statistically, there was a, like a, maybe a 2% difference. Well, you'd think that something like that, which, which shows you that having the mandates simply is not scientific. You'd think that a study like that would be just plastered all over Canadian media. I will let you know, among all mainstream media, only one, and that was Sun, Sun News Media, which uh, is, is really the, the small player here, and they're more right-leaning, but even they only gave it a, a story that was 123 words long. <clears throat> so every other major media outlet in Canada completely ignored that study. In the United States, that study made incredible waves. Mm. You had major publications like the Wall Street Journal commenting on it and saying, maybe we need to abandon our idea that uh, vaccine mandates are necessary or useful. So that conversation happened in the United States. But in Canada, silence. Give you one more example, because I'm probably boring people, but the British Medical Journal, let me think about the date, uh, the date on that. It was, it was November. So fairly recently, November uh, 2021, they had an investigative report where they gathered up significant evidence from whistleblowers. And what the main finding was, it was that Pfizer has lied about its safety data, and in particular, its safety data relative to children. So the British Medical Journal, one of the top journals in the world, publishes this in November. Not a single media outlet in Canada reported on this bombshell. I remember that one. I thought that you know, one was going to explode. I thought that was going to be huge. And it was crickets. And it was crickets. So here's my thought. I found that out because I was looking for it. Other people who are vaccine hesitant or against the mandates, they look at that and they say, oh my goodness, I've been lied to. 
How could I ever let my children be vaccinated, given that the British Medical Journal says that Pfizer has been lying? But in the absence of that being public knowledge, we instead see that people who are vaccine hesitant or against the mandates, they're demonized. Mm -hmm. They're said to be naive. They're, but not only that, they're racist, misogynist, when in fact they are probably, in terms of the knowledge, far more informed than the average Canadian. So, so Professor Haskell, you, you're, you're convincing me here that there is significant media bias. But I know people who really want to trust the mainstream media, and I think the argument would be there may be errors and some bias in the system, but we have these fabulous fact checkers, and, and they will set everything straight. Not only will they set the alternative media straight, but they'll also set the mainstream media straight. Like, is that going to work? Well, again, we've touched on this already. When the fact checkers are only chosen from one side, then you're never going to get the other side. And therefore, you'll never get the truth. So let me let me give you this. Uh, we we have in Canada a world expert in terms of immunology and vaccinology. His name is uh, Byram Bridal, and he is at the University of Guelph. And he has spoken out against the vaccines, saying that he doesn't feel that this that the uh, research done on these trial vaccines uh, legitimates their use, especially in those people who are younger and healthy. And he said that. Try and find any news publication in Canada that quotes him. In fact, you won't. You'll find only those publications that demonize him as fringe. So this, this man who up to the pandemic was given hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to research diseases. In fact, he was given a, hundred, a couple hundred thousand dollar grant to research COVID. So definitely at one point he was respected by both his university and the government, and now he's called fringe. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got another colleague of his, uh, Bonnie Millard. And Bonnie won the Governor General's Award for innovation in immunology. And now she's considered fringe. See if she's ever quoted as an expert. She's come out against the vaccine mandates and the vaccines in terms of their safety for certain populations, in particular the young. We, we've got uh, people at universities across Canada who have spoken out, I've spoken out. I, again, I'm not a medical practitioner, so you can't listen to me on this. You can listen to me related to, to bias in the media, although I'm sure that if this podcast becomes popular, I'll suddenly be a so-called so expert called, yeah. in media. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, it's just when you hear these fact checkers, uh, they simply find the people who will agree with them. Mm -hmm. And they discount, they discount the other experts who may have a better pedigree academically. I think one of the points that you've, you guys have drawn out here is that there seems to be a degree of unhealthy collusion among different epistemic institutions. So, uh, and I'm thinking of like these knowledge granting institutions like government, academia, media, um, and we could even say like uh, health, public health, right? that in, in some sense, they're all supposed to be independent. I think actually our universities have signed on to a declaration where we're supposed to be independent from government in our, in, our, in our workings and so on. But what it seems like what's happening is that there is this collusion or this commingling, intermingling among these. And, and maybe we've seen this really coming out in the pandemic because they've all presented the same common front. Like there was no... Uh, there, there was no dissent, <laughs> right? They were right. they were all presenting the same story, and that seems to me to be very unhealthy. Uh, what do you guys think about that? What I'm going to jump I'll, in. I'll oh, jump. you go ahead. Yeah, you're, we're interviewing you. Go, you go, Jeff. I'll say that reminds me. I got to bring up Chomsky again because that reminds me of stuff Chomsky said years ago, and it seems like just a more obvious version of stuff he was talking about years ago, where there's this conformity. And obedience that gets selected for and it's, he says it starts in kindergarten 
and you get in all the institutions that's all happening institutions, in all so right the all the way through and you just and it speaks to the 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 reference you made earlier dan when he's being interviewed and the, the journalist is saying like how do you know i'm self-censoring he's like well you're not self-censoring you're just you're just not necessarily aware of it um because you've been screened and selected and if you were non-compliant or disobedient or non-obedient at a certain phase of your rise you'd be gone and it seems like what's happening now is a more overt form of it where it's just more in your face and it's more physical out there in the world. It's not ideological or it's not subtle. It's not coming from the social learning. It's you got to do this thing. You got to declare publicly and do this thing or you're out. So in some ways yeah. you can make the case, I would say it's nothing new. Maybe it's the severity is newer. Or the so what you're saying is, is it, what you're saying is, there's been this selection for conformity and obedience in all of these institutions. All the way. Yeah, and now they, they all just obey each other and <laughs> or wh whichever one, whichever institution is on top. Um, and that leads to this conformity. And then those people who are more independently minded, there are these filters that get applied. Maybe the vaccine mandate is one such filter that then excludes people who have a different point of view. And that's how you get this homogenous uh, epistemic yeah. establishment. The table was set, so to speak, for this. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Your, your point, Dan, was that is this, uh, is this signaling greater societal harm? Yes. This is very concerning. And absolutely... It is. It is because here's what we know: the the institution <clears throat> that was charged with the job of making people critical thinkers has now abandoned its key mission. And I'm talking about universities. And they are saying, "You, there's one way to think." And and really, when we see what's happening with the COVID pandemic, this is just a, a symptom of something far greater, that the university now insists there is one way to think, and we will discriminate and punish those who do not think like us. And, the, and I'm not talking about wild, crazy ideas. It's just, if you bring forward empirical evidence that contracts the narrative that we've chosen, we will demonize you. And so then that has been abetted by the media. And so it's this death of critical thinking. And I want to give one more example. I want to bring this back to media bias and show you the death of critical thinking. Here we have, uh, just at the start of the truckers convoy, Prime Minister Trudeau does a press conference. And um, the press conference is to announce that he has contracted COVID. I mean, that was one of the focus focuses of this press conference. So... He's saying, I've contracted COVID. I'm going to be moving out of Ottawa. Now, it was very convenient. It was just as the convoy, Freedom Convoy, was moving in. He, he now had an excuse to run away. But the press conference, again, ostensibly is to say, I've got COVID. And uh, therefore, I'm leaving downtown Ottawa. Let's keep in mind, our prime minister was double vaxxed and then boosted. So in the parlance of the day, he's triple jabbed. And then at the end of his news conference, he says, I just want to remind everyone that the vaccines are safe and effective. Now, not a single reporter said, uh, excuse me, Prime Minister, I just want to talk to you about that effective thing. Uh, you're triple jabbed and you've got COVID. Not a single reporter asked that question that a, a kid in grade three would have been able to put together in their mind if they hadn't gone to university. <laughs> so, so my point is this, we're seeing the death of critical thinking and it's on display in, in the absolute uh, obtuseness of our reporters. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's got a brazen, it's in your face. Uh, and I think that asking that question about the effectiveness of the jab after Trudeau's announcement there would, would be considered a moral transgression. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wonder if people Ooh. have that question in the back of their minds, but they recognize it's th th this will actually get me kicked out of like, I'm going to be blackballed yeah. uh, in my industry. So I'm you just not going to ask that question. Audible gasps from your colleagues. like <gasps> Yeah.
I'm, or is it eyeballs. the case? Yeah, or is it the case that they just never even think of the question? Like that would be even more frightening to me. That, that the question doesn't even enter your mind. That's a question. That's a good question. So, so uh, indeed, fellas, there I am. I'm watching this press conference, and I'm I'm waiting. I'm thinking, is nobody going to ask this question? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> more, than that, more than this. Remember, he's made the claim at the end of his speech. I want to remind the population to get vaccinated. They are safe and effective. Okay, so we've already discounted this notion of effective, Mr. Three Times Jab, and now you're going away with COVID. What about the safety? Why did nobody say, oh, listen, Mr. Prime Minister, at the beginning of this vaccination campaign, how many vaccines were rolled out? Right, there was AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, and Pfizer. Now, in the early days, after being deemed safe, that we were told anybody could get this, two were pulled off because people were dying from blood clots. So we see AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson removed. They're still not available. Then this other vaccine, Moderna, which has said, oh, but it's safe. Well, then suddenly uh, across Scandinavia and in other countries, they're saying, whoa, wait a minute. We're seeing incredibly elevated cases of myocarditis and, and heart disease because of this. We, we're not going to use this anymore. In Ontario, the Ford government specifically said we're not going to uh, advocate Moderna any longer for people under 40, or maybe it was under 24. Regardless, the, the acknowledgement was this vaccine is not safe. So my question, again, if I had been a reporter, I would have said something like, gosh, Prime Minister, you know, you just said they're safe, but three are no longer deemed safe. And the fourth one, Pfizer, I just read a study that said they're lying about their safety data. Can you comment on that, please? Mm -hmm. But but crickets, not a single question of that nature. It's another moral transgression. You can't you can't ask that. <laughs> you're 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 filtered out if you do, right? You're out. You're out of the you're out of the establishment. So one of the things we like to so do maybe, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, maybe we really have to reconsider who is misinformed and who isn't. Mm. In light of the evidence, can we continue to say, I'm talking about the mob uh, who we see in social media, demonizing and criticizing those people who are vaccine hesitant or against the mandates. Can we really say that they're uninformed? Who's uninformed? Who's misinformed? Who's disinformed? Because I've got a lot of science behind where I stand, do you? So one of the things we like to do on this show is we like to talk about solutions. Do you have any recommendations or ideas on how to help people navigate this landscape? So knowing what you know about media, mainstream media, corporate media, what could people do? What recommendations do you have or strategies? The recommendation perhaps? would be uh, stop listening to mainstream media on most issues that are of a, uh, that can be shown to have an ideological bent because they're simply not telling you the truth. So essentially, it's incumbent upon anyone who wants to know the truth to go out and search for it themselves in independent sources. And you might have to go right to the studies themselves. And keep in mind that even within academia now, there's significant suppression. There was a major study that was conducted on uh, youth who were getting the vaccine. It was uh, researcher Jessica Rose did this. I, I can't remember the name of the journal. I do remember the name of the researcher. And it showed that the, the risk of myocarditis, heart damage from the vaccine was significantly greater for young people, especially males, than getting the disease itself. You know, your, your risk of hospitalization or injury was greater from the vaccine than contracting COVID. This study was, was accepted in a peer-reviewed journal, and the journal itself, then after peer review, after acceptance, after publication, retracted it. And the reason they gave was, well, as editors, we said in our agreement that we could retract after publication if we wanted to. There was no scientific reason given. Mm -hmm. It was simply the capricious fiat of the editors who probably were, were receiving a lot of pressure from government and, and other academics who said, that's not acceptable. 
that opinion's not acceptable. That those factual that that empirical data is not acceptable. So so even in those, I'm I'm suggesting people go out and look at uh, the academic studies. Even even in some of those cases, you've got to look pretty hard because. Uh, this um, censorship is spilling over into every part of our lives. Yeah, Dave, this leads to a very important question for me. Um, you often hear a recommendation for people who engage with information on the internet or wherever. The first thing they ought to do is to consider the source. And, the, and I think the assumption is that there are valid sources and then there are these other unreliable, invalid sources. But one of the th things that you're really pointing out here is the questioning of what are these valid sources and really you're kind of questioning it all the way down you're saying look we've got all these uh media outlets of journalism you got to be careful with those because they're biased and uh, they're omitting things and uh, you know they're they're skewing um their their coverage well then you know then you can go to the literature the scientific literature well you know that's not perfect either there's it's a it's a it's a human endeavor it's a social it's a social task to put signs together and there's a lot of potential pitfalls there as well. You got to worry about those a little bit. So it's like the first strategy, consider the source is already now problematic. How do I know what's a good source? Well, it, maybe it's a process of elimination. Mm -hmm. You can know that the mainstream media isn't. Right. That's we'll a take start. that one off the list. And, and, I've heard this, <laughs> and, and so, so I, I've heard this argument Oh, well, look at that. That's that. You can't believe that opinion. You can't believe that expert. Look where they were published. They were published in LifeSite News. They were published on Rebel Media. They were tr published on True North News. They always use that as uh, an epithet. But here's the truth. It's no longer the case that just because someone is published in what we'll say a lesser or a less well-known publication that what they're saying is not true or more valid. All it says is that they were not aligned with the narrative that is allowed. And so, so really the mainstream media, they've got it locked up. They've got this cycle where they can say, they, they actually will do this. They'll say, oh, look, person X, expert X, can only get published in that fringe, they'll call it fringe, fringe publication. So therefore you shouldn't believe it because they're only in the fringe publication. But the truth is expert X went to the mainstream publication, said, here's my excellent data. And the mainstream publication said, we're not gonna publish that. If we publish that, it goes against our ideology or we might not get the government funding anymore. So, so it's really, it's completely, it's a con game. Whenever they say, oh, well, don't believe that, it's in a fringe publication, because very often today, those people who are willing to speak the truth can only find the fringe, the, the lesser known publications to publish that truth. Mm. Because, because they're, they're willing to, to go uh, and stick their neck out, whereas the mainstream media won't. So you're saying, don't, you know, don't worry so much about the outlet source in terms of you know how it's respected maybe the better strategy is just to read widely and then look at as close as you can at the original information the original data in the scientific literature and maybe look for patterns and convergence among independent sources with that does that sound yeah, like a reasonable and strategy and it is and the other thing see who's saying it Look, if, if someone with a PhD, lots of grants, lots a, a spectacular record of research is saying something, maybe they are the dissenting voice that's truthful. Like Byron Bridle or so, Bonnie Millard, those sorts of folks. Yeah, yeah, right? So you say, gosh, up until two years ago, they were held up as world experts. Somebody like um, Robert Malone, uh, who who uh, apparently had um, a great influence on the creation of the mRNA vaccine. You know, up to two years ago, he was seen as uh, the go-to person for 
for judging whether or not certain vaccines and, and research should be funded into the millions of dollars. But then when he came out against certain practices with the vaccine, certain things that were said about the vaccine, suddenly he's, he said, well, that guy doesn't know anything. He's an idiot. Mm -hmm. um, and then he's forced to go on Joe Rogan uh, because other mainstream outlets, they say, well, he's going against the narrative that gets us paid or uh, makes us feel comfortable ideologically. So definitely look, look to see the credentials of the person, but don't be dissuaded if, if others in the mainstream media are saying, well, don't listen to them anymore. Because remember, on the Great Barrington Declaration, we had experts from Harvard, Oxford, and Stanford who were then called fringe. It's a meaningless term now. Mm -hmm. It's a meaningless term. I think you could even add to that, the like almost a meta perspective that under those conditions, the people who with the credentials, let's say, who are speaking out and are paying a price for speaking out, those are the ones you should listen to the most because I think so. They seem to Jeff, have the you, least you really, to gain and the country, most to that's, lose. Yeah. That's the re that's the recipe. If someone is willing to speak out at personal cost, just as you said, that's a really good indication you should listen to them. Mm. Well, Professor Haskell, we we are on in time here. Um, are there any final points you want to make or final comments you want to make before we end this uh, this episode? Uh, just so that your audience realizes what's been happening in media. If I had to summarize it, I'd say something like this. At one point, media at its best was saying, here are two sets of ideas, evaluate them, right? Here's two sides of an argument, evaluate it. That was media at its best. Then we saw media move to, here's one idea, it's the best, believe it. That was already very problematic. But now, in the last two years, we've moved from here's an idea that's the best, believe it, to here is a group of people, hate them. And that's really dangerous. Mm. And that's the movement that I see. And, and it's really important that we move away from that. That's all I have. That's great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Haskell, for for joining us for this very stimulating discussion. And uh, we hope that you will come back at a later point. Love you. Yeah, you guys pay great, so <laughs> I will. <laughs> All right, thanks, Dave. Thanks, David.